Ruby, Sigrid and Agnes. Well, today, as promised, we are reading the next chapter in the book Sophie's Tom. And here's a picture at the front of the book, just to remind you of the chapter, sorry, just to remind you who Tom is. And I'm not sure what Sophie's doing there, but it looks like she's taking her home with him, with taking him home with her. This chapter is called In Which Tom Disappears. Mm. Sophie's first thought was to fetch the cat something to eat. All animals must be regularly fed, she knew. And this one was sure to be hungry, even though it looked so sleek and healthy. Anyway, it was Christmas Day, when everybody eats more than they should do. So you come along with me, my dear, said Sophie, and we'll see what we can find in the house. She glanced at the living room window, but no one was looking out. So she plodded round to the back of the house and in through the door that led to the kitchen. The cat followed close at heel, just as though it had been following Sophie all its life. And just as though it knew what would happen next, it watched as Sophie opened the door of the fridge and pulled out some bits of skin from the remains of the turkey. She put them on a saucer with half a leftover chipolata sausage and some bits of bacon rind that her mother had put aside for the bird table. And there's a little picture of them on the plate. Help yourself, she said to the black cat, whatever your name is. She watched it eating. Actually, she said, you'd better have a name, hadn't you? Trouble is, I don't know if you're a boy or a girl. And you can't tell me, can you? Yeah, said the cat, raising its head from the empty saucer. Well, I think you're a boy, said Sophie, because you're greedy. So I shall call you Tom. She took a milk bottle from the fridge and poured some into a saucer and some into a glass. Cheers, Tom, said Sophie, and they both drank out of the saucer and the glass. Her mother came into the kitchen. Sophie, she said. What on earth are you doing? I'm giving my cat a drink of milk, said Sophie reasonably. Your cat? Well, he says he's mine, said Sophie. Oh, don't be silly. It probably belongs to the people next door. No, come to think of it, they don't have a cat. It must be a stray. What's a stray, said Sophie? A cat or a dog that's lost or hasn't got a home. Well, this one can't be a stray, Mummy, said Sophie, because he's got a home. Where? Here. Oh, no, he hasn't, my girl, said Sophie's mum firmly. That cat goes straight out of this house now, do you understand? Daddy doesn't like cats, you know that. And anyway, it doesn't belong to you. It's got a perfectly good owner somewhere, and it will make its way back to its own house, I'm sure. But how can he, said Sophie, he's lost. You said so. The milk finished, the black cat rubbed its purring way around Sophie's mother's ankles and automatically she bent to stroke it. I'm sorry, Puss, she said, but out you must go and that is definite. Take the cat outside, Sophie, please. And she was waiting for Sophie to kick up a fuss. But, to her surprise, Sophie simply said, OK, I'll just put my wellies on and my coat. It's cold outside. And when she'd done so, she looked at the mother with a look of deep disapproval and added, it's cold for cats too. And then she marched out and Tom followed on behind. At the bottom of the garden was the old potting shed where Sophie kept her flocks and herds of such animals, that is, as she was allowed to own, if you remember from the end of the previous book. There were wood lice, centipedes, earthworms, earwoods, slugs, snails, which lived in a variety of boxes, tins and jars. Most kept coming and going as they pleased, and most seemed to go, but Sophie continually replaced the losses. Now, out of sight of the house, Sophie opened the potting shed door and went in. The black cat hesitated on the threshold, but then with the curiosity of all his kind, he walked in. He jumped on a large box, on the side of which was printed, if you remember, in big black letters, big beans, 
and the word snails in big red letters. And then he proceeded to wash his face as cats do. And there he is, see, jumping on the box. Sophie stood watching him. She was rubbing the tip of her nose, a sure sign that she was deep in thought. And then she said, I've got it. Listen, Tom, you can stay here for a bit. I'll bring you food. I bring cornflakes and biscuit crumbs and cabbage leaves for these animals anyway, so no one will notice. And you'll be quite safe. Nobody comes down here in the winter. And I'll make you a nice warm bed. So she closed the door and then she took a wooden seed tray off a shelf and lined it with an old sack. Then she lifted the black cat with difficulty, because he was quite heavy, and put him on the sack. But with the contrariness of all his kind, he got out again and stood by the closed door, mewing. I'm sorry, my dear, said Sophie firmly, but here you must stay, and that is definite. Now, out of the way, please. But with a disdain for authority of all his kind, the cat took no notice, continued to mew at the door. Sophie, however, was more than a match for him in determination. Do as I say, Tom, she ordered. And when he did not move, she picked him up, plonked him down, facing the wrong way, and was out of the potting shed and had shut the door before he could do anything about it. At tea time, they started by pulling the crackers and putting on paper hats. And there's a picture of the crackers and the paper hats. Then Sophie's father said, What's this I hear, Sophie, about you bringing some stray cat into the house? Where is it now? Sophie disapproved of telling lies, and she had no intention of revealing the truth, so she said nothing. It's no good sulking, said her father. I'm not sulking. She took it out into the garden, her mother said. It will have gone by now. Good, said her father. You know I don't like cats. What sort of a cat was it, said Matthew, taking a huge bite of Christmas cake. A black one. Boy or girl, said Mark also taking a huge bite of Christmas cake. Boy, how do you know, chorus the twins with their mouths full, so it's more like, mmm. Because he bolts his food down, just like you, said Sophie. Boys are greedier than girls, everyone knows that. She cut off a very small bit of cake. You should chew each mouthful 32 times, she said, and popped it in her mouth. Like a pair of hawks, the twins watched the seemingly endless movement of her jaw and the moment she swallowed, they shouted, that was 37 times. Now don't tease your sister boys, said their mother, you know Sophie can only count to 20. Sophie was still sitting at the table when the rest of the family had finished tea. They supposed that it was the chewing that was taking her so long. But as soon as they had left the room, Sophie bolted down what was on a plate very quickly and then took off her paper hat, quickly wrapped up some leftovers in it and carried this parcel of food out of the back door down into the twilight garden. She opened the door of the potting shed a crack and called, Tom, here's your supper. But there was no mew from the dark interior. Sophie opened the door a little wider and poked her head round. There was just enough light left to see the shapes of the boxes, tins and jars that housed her flocks and herds and the sack covered seed tray that was to have been Tom's bed. But there was no sign of the black cat himself. Down on hands and knees to make sure he wasn't hiding behind something, Sophie found a gap in the boards at the back of the hut where the wood was rotten. A gap just wide enough for a cat prisoner to escape. Sophie felt terribly disappointed and sad. She'd been so sure in the short time that she'd known the black cat that theirs was a special sort of friendship and yet he had deserted her. However, she was determined to look on the bright side. Maybe Tom had just gone for a walk and he would come back eventually. He would need his supper. She found a shallow flower pot and tipped in into it the mess of cake and marzipan and icing sugar and caramel and marmite sandwich that she had brought. 
She filled the biscuit tin from the old water can where she kept there, sorry, which she kept there for dampening her slugs with. Finally, she propped the door of the potting shed ajar. Plodding back up the garden, Sophie called, Tom, Tom, where are you? But there was no answer. Early on a wet boxing day morning, Sophie went down to the shed, more than half hoping to find the black cat sheltering there. But a peep round the door showed only a fat mouse sitting in the flower pot eating Christmas cake. And there's a little picture of the fat mouse eating the Christmas cake. And throughout the rest of the holidays, there was no sign of Tom. Sophie played happily enough with her toy farm, and only her mother wondered why she was a bit quieter than usual. No one else noticed, because Sophie's father was back at work after the Christmas break, and Matthew and Mark were, as ever, perfectly content with each other's company. Maybe it's the prospect of starting school, her mother decided, that was making Sophie more than usually silent and solitary, spending so much time staring out into the garden. Maybe she was worried about meeting lots of new children. You like school, you know, uh, Sophie's mother said to her. I know, said Sophie. I'm looking forward to it. They'll have farming lessons. She still firmly believed this, even though the twins had rolled their eyes and tapped their foreheads when she mentioned it before. Her mother paused in the task of trying to make some sort of order of Sophie's dark, unruly hair. Not worried about anything, are you, darling? she asked. Sophie rubbed the tip of her nose. Only about Tom, she said after a while. Who's Tom? My cat, you know. Oh, he'll be all right. Cats are good at looking after themselves. But Sophie said, I wish I could have looked after him. On the morning of the last Saturday of the holidays, Sophie had just finished a game of Happy Families with her father and her brothers who had all agreed rather unhappily to play with her. She was driving her cows in for milking when her mother returned from some shopping and stood on Sophie's right, looking down at the array of toy animals. School on Monday, she said. Yes, said Sophie, I can do the morning milking before I go and the afternoon milking when I get back. Her mother handed her something wrapped in a little twist of paper. What's that, said Sophie. Just a little present before you start school. Sophie undid it. And what do you think it was? Well, it was a tiny model cat, a black one, with big orange eyes. And there's a picture of it. Well, Tom the cat has disappeared. I wonder if he'll turn up again in this story. We'll just have to wait and see, won't we? Tomorrow, it's a very, very big special day for Sophie. She's going to school for the first time. And Grandma will read that to you then. For now, I will say good night and goodbye.